very warm welcome to everyone. I am Shrija Agrawal. What we are going to discuss today is of significant importance as it could play a key role in India's ambition to have a $1 trillion digital economy by 2025-26. We know that there was a massive wave of digitization born out of the COVID-19 pandemic and the 5G and the fiber to home rollout. There's been a major internet penetration in India. We actually said to have 750 million internet users now. And with the rise in digital consumers and innovative platforms and solutions, definitely comes the need for data protection and accountability needed for internet companies, mobile apps, and businesses that handle citizens' data in India. But the growing reliance on technology by Indians, how important is it to safeguard personal information and ensure responsible data handling? Are businesses really transparent about the way they collect and process data? Do users truly understand how their data is used, stored, and shared? Do they get the privacy policies and how comprehensible are they? What does it take for these businesses to comply with data protection regulations? In India, for instance, there is a Digital Personal Data Protection Bill 2022, which is expected in the Indian Parliament during the monsoon session of 2023. What would be its role in the structure of tech regulations in India? Some say that India lacks comprehensive legislation for addressing data protection. Could this bill really address the issue? Can it safeguard the use of personal data while establishing the rights and duties of users and businesses? Can the bill really be a game changer in the world of data protection and privacy? And finally, could this be prepared for the evolving digital landscape of India? To dissect all of this, please help me welcome Arun Prabhu, partner and leading technology at Sri Lamachan Mangal Das, India's leading law firm. Arun, first of all, thank you for talking to us. It's my sheer pleasure and privilege to have you for this very meaningful discussion. I have about 35 odd minutes with you, and I think the great idea is to divide this discussion into three parts. For the first part, we will talk about the salient features of this bill primarily, but a very sharp focus on impact on Indian and global business. So my first question to you really is that how does this bill really compare with global frameworks and India's existing frameworks around data protection? What will really change for Indian and global businesses? Thanks, Shrija. Thanks for having me and uh, always excited to talk about this topic. I think it's a great time to be talking about it. Uh, I want to start off by saying it's not really one bill in the sense that, you know, it's different bills to different people. Uh, uh, like any horizontal data protection legislation, it's intended to do many things. It's intended to protect primarily the rights of citizens. It is intended to provide a judicial or rather legislative color to the principles which the Supreme Court of India laid down in the Puttaswami case. It is intended to enable businesses to collect, process and store data in a sustainable manner. It is, it is intended to enable governments to, to, to you know, decide and define how they deal with data. So it's a bill that does different things for different people. The focus of this conversation, I think, really should be how does it impact businesses? Because I think they are going to sort of be the tip of the spear as far as this bill is concerned. Now, moving on to your question itself, I think, again, uh, I'd like to answer it in two parts. First, I want to look at India's existing framework. India's existing framework is actually a bit of a Frankenstein monster. Uh, it, it, it's been created uh, you know, way back in 2000 when you were trying to enable digital signatures and uh, you know, documentation of that nature. You had the Information Technology Act and that document contains so many different disparate parts which have been stitched together. There is recognition for electronic signatures, there is recognition for digital contracts and then as an afterthought, you have one section really, or maybe two sections, which really deal with the confidentiality of information. And on top of that, you've built this really thin sort of fabric of rules, which is the IT rules, uh, you know, the 2011 rules on the basis of which we've sort of been pottering along for all these years. Um, given that the base statute itself is not of sort of modern extraction, and given that the rules have been mostly enforced in violation rather than in breach, You've got a data economy which is extremely, you know, to be transparent about it, permissive about things. 
protection is only for a very narrow set of information which is considered sensitive information enforcement is almost non existent and it's only after putaswami that we've seen courts step in and fill this vacuum to some degree compare it with that regime and this bill is a whole new world because it is creating a sense of simple enforceable transparent rights surrounding information which data subjects right or rather in india's terminology data principles will actually have the ability to enforce not only that this bill carries a big stick it is not just you know a technical sort of penalty it's not a slap on the wrist it's not saying okay pay 25000 rupees it's actually fines which are going up to a material number yeah this combination of a large series of uh, granular data subject rights and an effective enforcement mechanism to my mind will be a new dawn for data protection in india uh obviously like all global frameworks have seen we saw the gdpr that you know from the time it came into force to the time the first fine was handed down there was a certain period there was lots of guidance etc so there's obviously a lot of water still left to flow under the bridge but if this bill sort of gets fructified in the way it is currently contemplated businesses in india will have to fundamentally rethink what they do with data our approach to data till now has been please can we have some more please uh you know more data is good let's hold on to it forever let's collect as much data as we can everybody from a kirana shop to a hospital collects every piece of data that they can find and stores it often in an appallingly insecure manner fundamentally this bill is going to force people to rethink about whether data is actually an asset or a source of potential liability that's Moving so very to- well said yeah i want to pick up from i want to pick up from what you said i think that is a very very uh sort of beautiful kind of an overview of how this could be a game changer you said something very significant that shrija this could actually make organization and businesses relook at how they use data collect data now i want to understand that in this entire economy and you use the word data economy data was perhaps considered as a free resource i mean people said data is the new oil now how that oil has to be used can you be like very free in sort of using it what really are the questions that would play in my mind and most importantly as a startup as a technology startup which is raising a series c or a series d round of funding primarily as a data collection business because most of the startups really are at that at the fundamental level this could potentially be a huge game changer so is it as a benefit to startups or is it as a big sort of impediment to them does it really make them or mar them is my question to you uh again i think it depends uh fundamentally so so first of all right there is a potential for broad exemptions to be granted for certain types of enterprises startup has been defined under the bill and it looks like startups will get some relaxation there is clear recognition that they are a separate category which has to be treated separately and uh, in my experiences engaging with the government of india they are very very cognizant of the impact that something has on ease of doing business and innovation specifically those are both concepts which are very valuable and uh, you know given that this is administered by the ministry of information technology uh, this is something that is very dear to their heart so 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 take it for granted that this is a constituency which has been thought of and considered and factored in number 2 uh just because you're a startup this bill doesn't mean that it's a free pass doesn't fundamentally mean take what you do etc etc just like the market values responsibility innovation and sustainability as we're finding out in today's economy uh, startups will need to be sustainable about what they do with the data fundamentally a business that calls itself a data pro- collection business to my mind fundamentally doesn't really have legs in the long term if i am an acquirer like i'm a large listed company right that was the golden sunset for a lot of these startups large listed company comes by buys me out and i live happily ever after you know my island somewhere in the the, the the south of france well the moment a new acquirer is going to look at this till now they've looked at the data they've looked at the database and said oh they have a database of 250 million customers perfect let's value them at you know x rupees per customer let's acquire them we will roll it out blah 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 that is over as soon as this bill comes into force or even before because not only now will they look at what data you have they'll also look at what consents are associated with that data did you have a valid notice at the time you collected this data 
can they use this data for the purposes that they intend to use it for? Is there a valid consent associated with this data which continues to be valid under the new law? Is this data subject contactable so that they can give them a fresh notice? Because the new law requires that on the day it comes into force, everyone has to get a fresh notice. Can we reach out and actually give them this notice? Is this a toxic asset or is this actually valuable? Is this new oil or is this nuclear waste? Every entity that is in the m &A business is going to start asking this question. And this is not hypothetical. Globally under the GDPR, we have seen millions of dollars of fines being paid by the acquirer after they've acquired a toxic business. And India is going to be no exception to this rule. So startups which have done business responsibly in a sustainable manner and have had the appropriate documentation continue to be valuable because effectively this is a barrier to entry for irresponsible people. On the other hand, startups which have treated this as a data grab will have to think long and hard about what data they can use and how they can continue to use it. As it well put that the days of data grab businesses are perhaps practically over because you also use the word that you need to understand is it like a toxic liability for you or what really is its worthiness? You sort of need to reassess this from time to time and startups need to build their businesses in a more sustainable fashion when it comes to either capital efficiency or also use of data. I want to understand from you, Arun, that my very important question to you really is that regulation and there's this constant sort of stuffle between regulation and innovation which is why we have this entire new subject matter called reg tech if i'm an e-commerce business for instance and i have raised significant round of funding and if i'm a fintech business i'm talking specifically about two sectors because they're really in the midst of so much action right now if this data sort of if this sort of bill comes into action as a founder as an entrepreneur what really am I looking at, really? Because more often than not, regulation can also change the trajectory of your business. We already are seeing what is happening in the fintech space, for instance, aggregators and so many businesses, how they are licensing with RBI, some of those regulations. So now you have a data layer on top of it. So can you specifically shed some light on maybe the e-commerce business, because it's a very large business is being built on huge amount of data collection on a daily basis, and also fintech businesses, again, huge amounts of consumer data that they're grappling with. And then I can perhaps come up with the second part of discussion more in terms of intermediation. Yes. No, thanks for that, Shish. I think uh, two very important sectors that you identified, and I think Again, if if uh, businesses were the tip of the spear, then these guys are the absolute sort of, uh, maybe with healthcare being added on to that, the absolute sort of sharp end, right? Uh, let me start with e-com because the, the, the drafters clearly love e-commerce. Uh, if you look at some of the illustrations which have been added, they focus on e-commerce businesses repeatedly. And obviously e-commerce businesses have, 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 have had more than their fair share of regulatory affection over the last few years. And there's no reason to think why discontinue now but to me these businesses are fairly sophisticated about how they deal with data right and this actually ties back to an earlier question you asked me about international frameworks this 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 balance between enabling innovation and enabling uh, uh you know ease of doing business is a balance which has been found in multiple jurisdictions if we look at europe and the gdpr um there is at least some degree of worldwide recognition that that framework may to some degree have been extremely restrictive. It may have restricted the freedom of growth, it may have restricted how businesses operate. And if you're looking at this as a balance between, uh, you know, enabling free use of data or an open data economy and allowing, you know, sort of protection of the individual rights, perhaps it was a little too, a bit too heavy on one side of it. And then on the flip side, you have obviously, you know, complete laissez-faire regimes where you realize that, look, still not sustainable because your user is going to stop trusting you. If you do stuff which is sufficiently intrusive, sufficiently problematic in relation to data, users stop being comfortable with the product or the service, and then there's a sort of backlash that happens. So e-commerce businesses have learned to navigate these waters globally. Now in India, they need to be mindful of three principles, right? Principle number one is the concept of purpose limitation. It's a global principle. It's just been enshrined much more strongly in Indian law which basically means if you collect data for a certain purpose, you use it for that purpose or something that is reasonably related or ancillary to that purpose. You don't do this concept of bundling where you say, okay, I've collected your data to offer to sell you like a pen. 
I will use that data to deny you insurance two years in the future because I now know, you know, something about you which is problematic, right? So fundamentally, as long as purpose limitation and the second principle, which is of storage limitation, basically, if you collect data for a purpose, you keep it for as long as is necessary for that purpose. You don't hold on to it perpetually just because you've got it. You keep these principles in place, you can fundamentally navigate these waters pretty well. They must, of course, be aware that they will be in the subject matter of a lot of scrutiny because their data has businesses and you know these practices sort of come out uh the moment you know just like they receive complaints today around from consumers around delivery quality of products uh authenticity of source etc etc they will now receive data grievances it's just that there is a now a big fat heavy regulator sitting on top of that which has the ability to hand down significant fines in very short order as a result of which they need to be mindful of how they deal with their data and responsible about their data practices Moving on to the fintech sector, the fintech sector has an 800 pound gorilla in the room, which is the Reserve Bank of India. The Reserve Bank of India, to my mind, has been one of the most prescient and one of the most granular regulators in the data section. If you look at the digital lending guidelines, they have granular things about what your application can and cannot do. They have specific requirements around what data you can collect, what data you cannot collect, what data you can collect with consent and what data you can't collect anyway. The great thing about the, the Indian rules is that they are suitably recogni recogni they, they suitably recognize the restrictions that the sector regulator have put in place in terms of concepts like localization, in terms of what are reasonable practices for that industry, in terms of technical and organizational measures, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So given this recognition for the subject matter and for the sector regulator. Financial businesses, to my mind, and fintech businesses, to my mind, will still have to resolve around the RBI framework to the extent that they see deltas between what the RBI permits and what is permitted under the bill. Now is the time for them to go talk to their sector regulator and say, hey, we can do these three other things. You're restricting us from doing so. And we've been helping some of these businesses make these representations as well. So like any other space which is regulated by multiple regulators, you will see some degree of overlap and potentially some rough edges. But fundamentally, those need to be signed off. Okay. And what about global businesses? If I'm a global business, perhaps entering India or a global business with established presence in India, what really should it really set the alarm bells ringing for me, this kind of new framework? Because you sort of reiterated the fact that businesses will have to completely relook on how they look at data. So does it really set the alarm bells ringing for global businesses? No, because I honestly feel that as a global business, right, uh, likely to have complied with the GDPR, or at least have thought about the GDPR, uh, coming into India for the first time, I have less reinvention to do. I don't have a massive stack of files sitting in some basement in some city somewhere, which I don't know what they contain. I don't have some legacy employment records which last 30 years back. I'm coming into the business. I'm used to a heavily regulated economy. I'm coming into a framework which to my mind is far more permissive than the GDPR. Okay. It is far less prescriptive. It is far less problematic. It is far more principles based. Uh, it, it to my mind is a much more transparent framework than the GDPR is. And because a lot of the jurisprudence around it is being evolved now, and because it is subject to appeal to constitutional courts, global principles in terms of, you know, just data governance principles will continue to apply here as well. So as long as you come in with an open mind, you look at the law, you're duly deferential and respectful of the local requirements. You don't just try to say, hey, I'm compliant with the GDPR, your law doesn't matter. You actually apply your mind to what the local law says and you seek to comply with it. I think it's a great environment to innovate. I might go so far as to say that this framework, right, and this framework is to some degree based on Singapore's PDPA, to some degree it's based on the GDPR, to some degree it looks at other frameworks globally. I think this is a new approach towards data protection, which might be more suitable for economies which are growing quickly. Okay. That sort of uh, well said, and I sort of that sort of makes it very clear that this sort of new framework that we are sort of talking about is far less prescriptive and sort of more permissive compared to other international frameworks. So at least global businesses do not have so much to worry. So we talked about Indian businesses, we talked about startups, we talked about global businesses, and I think we got sort of a comprehensive kind of view on the first question which comes to the minds of every entrepreneur: the sheer impact any sort of new bill or sort of a massive framework can have 
on their immediate businesses. Uh, I do see some concerns ranging from startups or fintech or e-commerce businesses or some pockets of businesses per se. Now the second part of the question, really, the second part of the discussion, what about the personal data, really? And uh, what is sort of deemed consent here? I mean, this entire use of consent. I want to also understand this from a very layman consumer perspective. Because if I were to use any mobile app, they do give me a pop-up that I comply with their terms and conditions and the use and consent of data. But I'm not really sure how many of us really understand the fine print embedded there where we are giving the right to that organization to use our data. Do you think some of that could also potentially change with this overall framework? Can you give us some clear clarity on this one? Yes. Yeah, no, I have good news for you there because for consent to be valid under this framework, under this new framework, right? Look, market practice in India, like I said, was based on legislation that's decades old. That market practice is basically you have a very dense, very incomprehensible, long privacy notice. Uh, people have an all or nothing thing. If you want my service, you accept my notice. If I don't, you know, you opt out of it. Sometimes businesses don't even do that. So, so currently we're at actually a very, very bad place in terms of compliance. Very, very high standard of transparency and comprehensibility, which is being put on businesses in order to take consent from the average citizen. Now, does this mean that your privacy notice is magically going to become one sentence long? No, it's not. Uh, there will still be complexity there. But I think it's a great, I mean, if you have ever tried looking at uh, privacy notices under the EU GDPR, you actually see a lot of transparency broken down into simple phrases right up front, like, you know, a summary. And then you have a detailed notice at the bottom, which has a lot of the other details. Look, the the... It's, it's clear that the ways in which data is collected, stored and processed are increasingly complex as time goes by. And as a result of that, businesses have to do these complex policies. But now there's a legal requirement to make it understandable to everyone. And to the extent something wasn't understandable or in complex language, you can say, look, the consent I gave was not a valid consent because you wrote this in this way that I was fooled by. Right. Moving yeah. on, the second very important aspect to this, which also answers your question, is that of a consent manager. So one of the unique innovations of the Indian framework is that you've created a new type of intermediary called a consent manager. That consent manager can be used by you like you do under the account aggregator framework to signify your consent in relation to data. So for instance, if I have an account manager, say, you know, it's a, you know, there's a crystal for data, that consent manager will have all of my data consents in one place. So I will say my consent is provided to process my healthcare information to provide me with emergency medical care but not to process my healthcare information for any other purposes. You can process my contact information to offer me goods and services to which I have expressed an interest. You know, I can have granular consent frameworks, presumably by some sort of pull down list. And then after that, it is that consent manager who has to go and communicate it to the rest of the internet. They become my agent in terms of how my consent is managed. And one day if I wake up and say, you know what, these insurance companies are calling me too much. I don't want them to do it. I can go to my consent manager and in one place say, you may no longer use my contact information to offer me insurance. And they have to globally go to all the various other data controllers, or in this case, the data fiduciaries and withdraw my consent from them. Saying you no longer have my consent to offer me marketing services on insurance. This framework has a lot of power if it's implemented properly. And I think it will be very, very disruptive in terms of preventing consent fatigue and in terms of allowing people to control their own data. Okay, so it sort of really allows people to control their data, especially, so I share my data, but I can also sort of have a control on how my data is being used. So that is perhaps applicable for sort of more private companies or mobile apps I use, food delivery apps I use, or you gave an example of an insurance company. But what about, say, government agencies, where perhaps there's kind of an interpolation theory being sort of in works where we are kind of treated like a subject that you invariably, without thinking so much, you sort of give your data to sort of a government agency, right? So how does that relationship work between me as a citizen and the government having my data? So three things, right? First, uh, this bill has changed a lot from the draft that was tabled earlier. Oh. I think there have been more than 20,000 submissions which have been heard. There have been several dozen rounds of uh, consultation. 
and obviously civil society has expressed some of this in fairly granular terms now leaving that aside and i'm not really getting into the 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 the, the civil society side of it but one of the things you will see in the bill is that there is a clear requirement that when the government processes data it has to do so in accordance with applicable law and with the policy that is put forth by the government for that purpose so that's the first aspect of it it's not like they have no rules they have their own principles they have their own policy they have their own rules which they have to comply with there are certain exceptions of course prevention of crime protection of sovereignty security etc but those are global exceptions you will find them in many global regimes as well it's not an india only thing number 2 more fundamentally our constitutional courts are not going anywhere right there is nothing in this bill that takes over the jurisdiction of the high courts or the supreme court in fact appeals from the data protection board lie to the high court the puttaswami judgment is not going anywhere our supreme court of india is not going anywhere and the fundamental the full brand of these principles of data I mean, like the aadhar act right i mean parts of it was struck down data to be held for six for three years was struck down and read down to six months and so on courts have not been shy in censuring governments when their data protection practices are excessive that framework is not going anywhere the ability to appeal against a breach is not going anywhere right so to my mind that's the second level of protection and i think the third level of protection really is far more fundamental i think much like there is a private market much like there is a market between food delivery apps there is also a recognition from government that an element of trust and citizenship engagement has to be necessary to drive that all important agenda of e governance if mm-hmm. there is a you know and you see this in digi locker you see this in atmanirbhar bharat you see this in uh, national digital health policy so you see a framework where the government is increasingly responsible about data or at least responsible about thinking about data to make sure that citizens are actually incentivized to engage on online platforms to my mind these three things should not be ignored while looking at the position of the government look very clear that government is 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 treated in a certain way under this bill there is also possibilities that this will be evolved further as it makes its way through parliament there might be challenges to it etc etc but fundamentally it's not as if this is a lawless wild west there are principles which are in place both in the bill and outside the bill to protect okay i'll tell you one thing about uh, this uh, arun we have spoken about how this could be a potential game changer the salient features of these bill and you also sort of mentioned that when you compare to sort of other international frameworks it really sort of appears to be far more permissive than prescriptive but let's really talk about some critical aspects in terms of the critiques of this i mean what would those really be and not necessarily critique in the correct sense of the word but what could potentially be the certain loopholes and ambiguities in this act that would lead to misuse of personal data what could be done effectively to address this and do you see any potential for violation of citizen privacy so look uh, i think let me ask you answer your last question first right potential for violation violations of privacy occur when in two circumstances the first they occur because of the inadequacy of standards and practices basically because someone was careless with data or did not take the necessary care about data right the second is when there is a systemic or a or a or a structured attempt to collect large volumes of data and process it and so on and so forth what this bill does is it fundamentally creates a base set of rules which everybody in the market has to comply with and implement in terms of how they protect data whether that is reasonable security practices technical organization and so to my mind it is clearly creating a culture of compliance it is not going to stop breaches from occurring no one in the world can look if there was a piece of legislation that could help all data breaches from occurring we would have seen that globally data breaches are an information security and cyber security problem and as you've seen with you know evolution along ai you know the, the attacks from threat actors are becoming increasingly more sophisticated so even if you sort of have a lock and your door and 15 different sort of combinations on it people will find a way to come in through the window and that's a that's an ongoing debate right that's an ongoing process that keeps going are you required to engage with that debate are you required to do your best to protect the data this will create that obligation now going back to the to the you know the question as to whether how it compares with international frameworks are there vulnerabilities under this bill i think it's a question of approach and philosophy when you have like a 130 page document and you know 700 800 pages of guidance 
there is an authority which has laid down many, many rules and principles, basically thousands of pages of information, the gaps through which uh, interpretation has to happen become smaller. That's not the approach we've gone, right? It's a, it's a brief document. It's a, you know, a couple of, it's a dozen plus couple of dozen pages. It's very, very brief. It's very, very concise. It's not prescriptive. It doesn't say, oh, this is the standard you have to apply, et cetera. That has advantages. It allows for flexibility. It allows for standards to move with time. It it allows, for instance, that, you know, tomorrow if something is obsolete, you can't stick to that obsolete standard in tomorrow law like we see today with some of the things which are already there. It allows for a dynamic economy. It allows for innovation. The cost of it is that people will try to interpret things in creative ways. And that interpretation may, in the short term, be a problem until someone slaps their wrist really hard and they move on. Now, one of the ways to solve for this, of course, is rule making. There is still METI. Again, nobody shut down METI, right? METI continues to exist. The act actually lists down all the various aspects on which rules will be. So I think you also spoke about the fact that until there is a big sort of fine or sort of notice slapped against a company sort of for them to understand and learn their lessons. One also sort of gathers that there's also something called a voluntary disclosure mechanism, which basically sort of enables companies and organizations to sort of come forward and basically disclose voluntarily on the breaches, data breaches by these companies. And they're also an alternate dispute resolution mechanism, which is perhaps being recommended. So you want to talk a little about that, that the government is pursuing it sort of very, very seriously because you're not really talking about data breaches sort of worth like a crore, two crores anymore. It could actually go to something as meeting and meaningful as 250 crores also. So there's a chance for organizations to perhaps come forward and really own the mistakes that they have done. Can we sort of say that? It's a potential way in which this provision, look, a lot of this depends on how the Data Protection Board treats it. Depends on how, so, so voluntary undertakings, uh, you know, is a feature we've been seeing on a lot of drafts seen this in the telecom draft, hopefully we'll see it in the Digital India Bill. Uh, fundamentally, voluntary undertakings are a mechanism where you, instead of saying, pe people recognize courts are overburdened. People recognize that this top-down form of enforcement where, you know, someone sends you a notice, you come show cause, I give you a big fine, you shut your business, you go open a business the next day with a different name and do exactly the same thing or a slight variation of the same thing. Doesn't really work for anyone. It's not great for the economy because there's no predictability. It's not great for the government because you keep handing down fines. At some level, it's not a great solution, right? So, I mean, in our own sort of Indian way, we've tried to figure out a way to have these conversations and find via media solutions without putting anyone out of business. And the way to do that is this combination of voluntary undertaking and data and, uh, uh, you know, this, this concept of doing a... Uh, 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 alternative dispute resolution. Okay. Now, the, the way this sort of works is, uh, look, a breach is a breach. It still has to be notified. Right? Mm. So, so if my data is leaked, they still have to notify me. They still have to notify the data protection board. So no one is taking away the underlying offense. Once that is done, now if a company goes and says, sir, we had done these 10 things. We didn't do this 11th thing. This is how the breach occurred. We are proactively putting this 11th thing in place. We've generally been well behaved. We've generally been compliant. Please don't issue a massive fine to us and kill us. And the data protection board can say, yes, you've been acting in good faith. This is not a willful thing where you were trying to sell data. This is a threat actor finding their way past your boundaries. You take these additional measures and we move on. If tomorrow this entity goes back on this provision, there's a voluntary undertaking which gets withdrawn or gets violated in some form, the data protection authority can go back and reimpose the first file. So this is not without consequence. This is not some backroom dealing which is there. This is a transparent sunlight you know, driven mechanism where informal solutions can be found to formal problems. So at least that's how I hope it will play out. Obviously, practice has to be evolved. This is completely new, new regulator, new law, new everything. Okay, so we still sort of jury still out on this one, how sort of it will play out and we have to yes. see. Yes. Uh, I want to understand. But, 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 but I mean, at the risk of, I mean, just to take off on, on what you say, I think everyone is sort of make, uh, driven towards making sure it doesn't get before a jury or in this case, a judge. The idea <laughs> here is to find an interim solution. Yeah, to have an alternate resolution mechanism. Yeah. I want to understand from you that the bill also says that some activities like trading, sort of tracing debtors could also be done because it is definitely for the larger benefit of the people and also helps keep things sort of safe and sound. 
Now, could there be potential abuses of these exemptions? So, to what do you think? And I also want to understand from you that what could really be done to protect people from unwarranted data processing? Couple of things. Okay, so so firstly, these exceptions are a lot narrower than they could have been, right? Whether we look at the expert committee report from Sri Krishna committee, whether we look at the last version of the bill or whatever it is, these exceptions are actually much narrower than they used to be. In fact, I think they're too narrow. I think some exceptions like the search engine exception, processing of publicly available data, uh, you know, private m &A, some of these things which have been taken out to my mind are problematic. Uh, but be that as it may, the portions which do remain are very, very narrowly defined. Second, they are subject to the underlying legal framework that governs them. So it is a debtor from whom debt is due subject to the underlying framework on disclosure of data, et cetera, et cetera. So there is very strong protection there. Second, even to that extent, even independently of this, in all of these circumstances, like I said, there is a regulatory framework in place from the subject matter regulator, right? So whether it's a loan recovery agent uh, for a lending application, the RBI Fair Practices Code applies over there and they've you know, had no hesitation handing down fines, shutting down people, et cetera, et cetera, when they go off the reservation. So it's not a blank slate. There is substantial protection in place. Yes, there will be people who will act like idiots and try to use this exception or take the thing that, Achha, this person owes me debt so I can process his data in some ridiculous way. But eventually, I think the ecosystem will become more sophisticated and realize what is okay and what is not. Okay, uh, talking about bad actors really and people who can sort of misuse, let's talk about what has really taken the world by storm really, which is artificial intelligence. It's not that it's a new invention, it's been in works for a while, but really the generative AI and its advent has pretty much changed the game for everything. Talk about the creative industry, for some portions, even legal industry, one can say perhaps every industry. In fact, uh, there was a famous saying that barring the job of a hairdresser, perhaps everything under human existence is at risk of generative AI. Now, I want to understand from you that does the advent of generative AI really have equal benefits on the policy side to combat exploitation and misuse that may happen through bad actors? Yes, I mean, in a word, yes. Uh, I think uh, generative AI is far broader than a data conversation. It's far broader even than a technology conversation. I think it's a concept that will change the times we live in. Um, I, I, I think 10 years from now, if we look back at this conversation, we, we will both be very surprised at how much we underestimated the impact of this innovation. Uh, but to, to answer your narrow question, whether it is under this framework or under the Digital India Bill, uh, or the Digital India Act when it eventually comes out. Uh, fundamentally, AI is a tool which has a tremendous real and present uh, potential for disruption, uh, both in a good and a bad way. Disruption in a good way in the sense it allows innovation, it allows leapfrogging, it allows businesses to sort of move ahead, it allows all these wonderful products and services that we're seeing in a bad way because it allows threat actors to use exactly the same tools like any other tool right it's uh, you know a crude analogy would be the invention of the the the, the firearm uh, both in good and bad ways significant impact for everyone but from a reg tech perspective and from a indian regulators perspective i think there is strong recognition about the fact that ai is disruptive and that it can potentially be used in a lot of ways to uh, so for instance you see triar ai recently putting out ai based mechanisms to filter uh, you know spam messages so, so there is a clear hands-on regulated. The RBI has its own principles on it. SEBI has come out with its own principles on it. So Indian regulators are very aware of the defective potent, the, the, the disruptive potential of AI and potentially to come back and have granular regulation as the sector evolves. Okay. Uh, we spoke about uh, really the use of AI and sort of bad actors and all of it. But really, when you talk about AI also, we're already seeing exploitation, be it in terms of gender, be it in terms of biases, be it in terms of like the children usage of data also, because AI is sort of so pervasive. I want to understand from you what specifically has been done to address the processing of personal data, especially for children and children, let's take sort of under the age of 12, in terms of parental consent and preventing tracking or targeted ads. So look like the previous bill, uh, unfortunately, the version still continues to treat everyone below the age of 18 resolutely as a child. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't 
personally, I don't feel this is the right balance. I think there was some scope for flexibility. I feel the reality has moved a little bit. But be that as it may, uh, the legislative wisdom has also been that they've put in a very simple, they've put in an innovation which allows for a lower age to be notified. So they've allowed for three kinds of relaxations. First, they have said that certain types of processing we might exclude completely. So I can think of things like emergency, you know, child help services, uh, counseling services for abused children. You know, those are cases where you can't get parental consent because often it's the parent who's doing the abusing or the guardian who's doing the abusing. So you need uh, you need you need to process data independently of that. So one hopes those will be notified. Second, they've said when an entity has come and proved to us that it is generally responsible with children's data, we can reduce the age as far as that entity is concerned. And third, they've also provided for the overall age to be reduced by way of a notification rather than an amendment. To me, this is a much more flexible framework than was previously contemplated, which is like 18 bright line, everybody below that is a child forever. Uh, it depends on how this flexibility is used. There are still restrictions on things like uh, targeting, advertising at children and so on and so forth. Again, I continue to feel as I've expressed previously publicly that some of these restrictions are written more broadly than they should be. But clearly, there is a balance to be found, you know, for exactly the reasons that you described, uh, you know, which is protecting children while enabling appropriate age appropriate products and services to be targeted at them, like education, like content, you know, targeting is not necessarily a bad thing. So, so perhaps we'll see a little more flexibility in rule making and some of the exceptions that I just described. Okay. I also want to understand from you that uh, we spoke a little about penalty, but let's just spend some little more time there on what really are the odds. I mean, because the, the size of uh, the financial penalty seems to be mammoth. I mean, it sort of goes to as much as 250 crores that you're talking about. What really are the odds that high financial penalties that are imposed on data fiduciaries that are not compliant? Could sort of hinder innovation competition, right? And would you see that as a risk well worth taking? Can sort of organizations sort of really uh, trespass and say, okay, let's just risk, let's just take that? And would this sort of really affect small businesses and startups? What really is your, because we began the conversation with a sort of very impactful conversation on impact on businesses and startups. It's a good idea to sort of talk about penalties to them also. Yeah. So look, firstly, the numbers on the bill, while they're very scary, are caps. They're not <laughs> floors, right? Uh, there is an entire section that deals with how the cap will be, you know, what are the factors that will be taken into account for that cap to be imposed, etc. Third, uh, like I said, this government is aware of the impact of innovation and the chilling effect that massive penalties and fines have on especially smaller players. Fourth, uh, Sometimes to be taken seriously, you need to carry a big stick. Uh, lastly, at the end of the day, to answer your question squarely, I think it will depend on what they do with this stick. Yes. yes. Globally, the tendency has been for regulators to have long, detailed conversations before they start handing down fines. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have guidance which comes out. You have this thing. People send you polite notices. People send you. Uh, and, and even if you look at India, uh, like under the certain rules and so on and so forth, while there are provisions for like imprisonment, which used to be the big stick before, uh, they're not used very often. They're, they're only, they're, it's only egregious cases where you'll see something like this. So one hopes that this new, uh, you know, this new authority or this new board rather will be mindful of its impact on the innovation ecosystem, that they will use this stick very lightly that they will have conversations and try to encourage good behavior before they actually slap it down. And then, like I said, there's always an appeal to the high court. So if you feel someone has been arbitrary, if someone has been irrational, not taken into account all of those gating conditions, uh, you have the ability to go to a high court and appeal and high courts do look at these things. More importantly, uh, I think, again, it's not a homogenous data economy, right? So there's a small little startup with five founders doing something really cool and innovative uh, mm -hmm. with not publicly available information like names and contact numbers. On the other end of it, you have a massive international data broker who's collecting massive volumes of healthcare information. Uh, the, the, the act has to provide for both. Uh, the, the big stick is for the, you know, the really bad actor, uh, uh, the, 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 the small sort of, uh, you know, slap on the wrist or voluntary disclosure or alternative dispute resolution mechanism, all of those things, voluntary undertaking, all of those things for the smaller actors. 
It's about judicious usage of these measures. And remember that your first constituency continues to be your subject, your user. So for instance, if my service provider came and said, Arun, your contact information was breached because someone hacked my systems. Here is the security I had in place. Here are the principles I had in place. I'm really sorry. Please change your password. I'm not going to go fight for something saying, because remember, this is not a compensation mechanism. It's a penalty mechanism. It's not like I get the money. So fundamentally, I am not going to go to the data protection authority and file some complaint just because of that. On the other hand, if someone has taken my data without my consent, someone has been really nasty about how they process it, it has had an impact on me, it's had an outcome on me. Obviously, I'm going to go to this authority and you know aggressively pursue my case. So I also feel that your primary constituency here, as it should be, continues to be the data principle. You are a fiduciary to the data principle. If you keep your data principle happy, very likely the fines are not likely to come on. Okay, that sort of sort of makes it sort of very very clear. I also want to understand from a deal making point of view, when two companies are getting into a deal, be it a private equity infusion, not so much, uh, but you're talking about M and A. When a company A acquires a company B, how much do you think this entire game change, your data protection bill, sort of really comes into play? Because most of the businesses that are being bought, and uh, one really is buying for data or they have access to more and more customers. They have a larger consumer base. That is what we hear from a player A, at least buying or snapping the player B, right? When you talk to these investors or talk to these large corporate sponsors. Do you think a bill like this, which has, even though which is sort of so permissive in nature, can actually hinder deal making because people don't necessarily want to take that headache? Or do you think it will actually sort of speed up deal making? What really is your sense? I think it will be a continuum. At the beginning, it will make everybody step back and be very careful about things because it will be baby steps, right? The first few deals which are happening, new regulator, you don't know what fines are going to come. So everybody's going to be very careful. I see diligence going up very significantly. Mm -hmm. I look at technical expertise sort of being involved. I look at people looking at consent notices and privacy policies very carefully. I look at, you know, people moving beyond just textbook, you know, okay, are you compliant with it? Do you have a privacy policy type questions? Uh, I see sophistication working its way into the market. And as with all deal making, you'll sort of see this making its way into term sheets. You'll see boards starting board reporting or investment committee reporting starting to factor this into place. You'll see WNI insurers starting to cover some of this because you know they'll start seeing this as a key matter risk. Uh, and, and once the market finds its own level, people will recognize that this is the new state of the art. But once that happens, I feel this will actually accelerate things because everyone will be playing at the same field. This massive disparity of one person being a data thief while the second person is hyper compliant because he's a subsidiary of a GDPR company. This massive disparity in the market will go away and everyone will look at assets uniformly. Obviously, there is going to be some, some incidents where obviously fines are done because of new assets. But to my mind, I think that's a necessary requirement uh, to for more responsible deal making, just like you see on the ESG side, just like yeah. you see on the corporate governance side today, just like you see, for instance, in terms of, you know, share capital buildup, right? Share capital buildup is something you've traced for the last two, three decades, because fundamentally there, there are principles around it. I think it's going to move to the data space as well. And it's very, very necessary. If you're selling a business on the basis of an asset, that asset better be real and it better be acquired properly. I, sort of, I think that sort of really puts it uh, forward in a very clear way. I also want to understand from you, Arun, then what we sort of spoke about this, that Shrija, perhaps initially there will be continuum, people will be treading with caution. You want to understand, toy with the new regulator, get some comfort with it. So the organizations will also change. We're talking about different board here. The role of a chief technology officer is no more the same. Perhaps in the board meetings, in the boardroom, while you have a CEO, you have a COO, you have a CTO, there is a room for somebody at a chief level who understands the data privacy, these policies. So even the way the organizations will be constructed, the leadership team, the C-suite will also change. What really is your sense? I mean, post-2023. Absolutely. Completely new constituency, completely new stakeholder. See, till now, businesses are focused on what does my investor think? What does my shareholder think? And maybe what does my customer think? Nobody has focused on what does my data principle? Remember your data principle and your customer may not be the same, right? If you're a data driven business. More importantly, as we have seen, for instance, in the RBI's framework, uh, as we've seen in the SEBI framework, 
when a independent vertical that worries about a certain kind of risk, right, whether that is cyber risk, whether that is information security risk, or now in this case, data risk, when you see a separate vertical and you see the board being personally accountable for it, you see auditors starting to ask questions around data practices, you start seeing a regulator which hands down massive fines and so on and so forth. You effectively have to stand up a new vertical which basically deals with your primary stakeholder, which is the data fiduciary. So at its base, it will be a sophisticated grievance redress and mechanism and a grievance officer. If you're a significant data fiduciary, you will need a data protection officer. That data protection officer will then have potentially report to a data auditor who will do a data audit on you. There will be impact assessments which are conducted. So it's a whole complex regulatory framework if you're a significant data fiduciary. And maybe one level below that, you have the ability to, to uh, do this in a more asset light manner. If you are just a mere data fiduciary, uh, then you need some basic framework in mind. But there will definitely be new actors in the board. There's a definite shout out to CEOs and how they have to constitute their board sort of going forward. No, and I'm so glad we had this discussion because it's been such a meaningful discussion and really understand its various impacts to various stakeholders. Now, my last question to you, we spoke about uh, this bill and you laid out the salient features, the implications, what the penalties would be, the entire importance of deemed consent, the entire sort of role of a consent manager, what could be the potential bad actors, the entire implications of AI. Now, I want to understand from you that if this bill is so sort of far reaching in its impact, it is so game changing. And as we sort of pointed out, that compared to other international frameworks, it's actually far more permissive, far more concise than being prescriptive in nature. Then, what could be the potential backlash, really, when it is tabled in the monsoon session of the parliament? Is it just a backlash for the heck of it? Or do you really think that there was still some juice left in terms of making the bill A plus? Look, uh, I think it's a it's a combination of both. There's obviously, um, like I said, there are considerations around this bill which are being agitated on the basis of impact on civil society, impact on the rights, government powers, so on and so forth. At least looking at it from my lens, right, which is that of a as a that and 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 of course, you know, as somebody who's been a you know a privacy lawyer for two decades now in 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 this market, we've been dying and we've been waiting eagerly for market standard general data protection legislation, right, which is enforceable and valid, a predictable, clear framework, which we're not relying on courts to step in after the fact and put out the fire. To my mind, the need for this bill, and especially the version that has come out after this extensive consultation, is deep. It is deep. It is strongly felt. While there is significant value to parliamentary debate and there is significant value to fine-tuning it, and obviously, you know, people know their constituencies best and hopefully they will improve and refine this instrument, I think there is an urgent need for it to be implemented. There is an urgent need for it to be adopted. So, Perhaps looking at this from a slightly partisan manner, I would say the worst thing to do here may be to do nothing at all. Mm -hmm. So definitely the need of the hour and move away from a bill which was perhaps 20 years old and archaic. We definitely need something which is in time. So time for rapid fire. Just quick two questions from you and you have to get quick answers. What does privacy look like for you in 2024 and beyond? I think it's going to be a much more granular empowered framework much more aligned with the global standard okay if you were to give one sound suggestion to the regulators at large concerning the bill what would those be like an elevator pitch like a two minute sort of shout out what would that really be i i think it's uh you know exactly what i used earlier which is uh you carry a very big stick you're responsible for a very important trillion dollar innovation economy uh, you are putting in place a new framework to a bunch of people who are completely not used to it. So please tread lightly and use your stick very carefully only when needed. Okay. The last question, India's trillion dollar economy by 025, 026, how realistic? Absolutely. Absolutely. I will always be positive and gung-ho about India. I think it's an idea whose time has come. Okay, an idea whose time has come. Thank you so much for this, Arvind. We had a very meaningful conversation on various aspects of data privacy, especially concerning the bill. And I just hope that it actually becomes a very significant part when the Digital India Act comes in and let's see sort of what really happens for the future. Thank you. I see you next. Goodbye and good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Richard.